Now, please welcome our moderator, Tara Coit. She is an award-winning author, entrepreneur, marketing strategist, and founder of the Tara Coit Publishing Fund for Scholars Chronologically the Black Experience. She's also a painter, a playwright, photographer, and speaker. Her book is Real Talk About LGBTQIAP. Her articles and editorials have appeared in numerous publications. She is also on the board of the Atlanta Writers Club, the Atlanta Technical College Foundation, and the Decatur Book Festival. Author uh, Jen M. Jackson is a queer androgynous black woman, a lover of black people, of all black people, and an assistant professor at Sarah Cruz University in the Department of Political Science. She's the author of the book, Black Women Taught Us and Policing Blackness. Jen is now a columnist at Yes Magazine, focusing on gender and sexuality, black feminism, and politics. Academically, Jackson's research is in black politics and a focus on racial threat and trauma, gender and sexuality, black politics, and social movements. Renee Bracey Sherman is a reproductive justice, reproductive justice activist, abortion storyteller, and writer. She is also an executive producer of Ours to Tell, an award-winning documentary elevating the voices of people who've had abortions. And Renee and Regina co-host of the A-Files, A Secret History of Abortion, a podcast from The Meter. With her co-author, Regina Mahone, she, she wrote Liberating Abortion, Claiming Our History, Sharing Our Stories, and Building the Reproductive Future We Deserve. Our last author is Regina Mahone. She's a writer and editor who works, who, excuse me, who work explores the intersec intersections between race, class, and reproductive rights. She's a senior editor at The Nation Magazine, a monthly newsletter and global efforts to protect reproductive freedom. Regina has written for publications including Cosmopolitan, L, Rewire News Group, the nation, and many others. Please welcome our authors. Yay, us. First of all, I want to say, did anybody notice that these ladies are color coordinated with their book cover? Who does that? <laughs> Thank you all, Renee, Regina, Jen, and all of you for coming out with us this afternoon. It's very important to us. Certainly, uh, we don't want to sit up here talking to ourselves. We could, but since it's the Decatur Book Festival, we're happy to have you here. Uh, full disclosure, I met Regina a few months ago at a Planned Parenthood Southeast Gala. And she told me about this book and that it, was, it would come out on October 1st. And I said, guess where you need to be on October 5th? <laughs> and here we are. So I'm glad, I'm glad that our team agreed with me. This is a powerful and important conversation that we must have. So thank you all for being here. And then our team found Dr. Jen Jackson. And I said, absolutely, this makes perfect sense. Women Who Taught Us and Liberating Abortion. So we're gonna jump right in it. I have um, some questions, some things that I, I was surprised to see in the book. Now, I, and I'm gonna ask the audience to help me out. I want you to raise your hand if you've heard any of these. Abortions power your lights and electric grid. What, what, that's what I said. Fetal parts are floating in your drinking water. You heard that. Abortions cause, get ready, tornadoes, droughts, and hurricanes. You heard that? I had to, I was like, 
they made this up. I'm, they're gonna, we're gonna go to the next paragraph and they're gonna tell me that they made this. No, these are things that people have said. And all I could say was, I can't say this the full way, but WTF. So, and I wanted to start with that because, I mean, it's ridiculous, it's funny, it's absurd. And it gives us an insight into, I guess, the, the mentality and the motivations of people who want to oppress women, who want to limit women's autonomy and humanity. And I, you guys have a chapter, chapter six, called abortion splaining. Now, I call it lies, but maybe that's why they wrote the book and I didn't. <laughs> but would you please talk to me about, first of all, why abortion splaining, instead of just flat out saying these people are lying, um, and then talk about abortion splaining and what does, what it's about. Why, why is this a tool? Because clearly it is a tool. Yeah, so abortion splaining is a term that I coined. Um, it's kind of like mansplaining, where they like tell you what you already know, even if you're an expert in it. But it was something that as I had an abortion when I was 19, and as I would talk about my abortion, or I've been doing reproductive justice and abortion access work for 15 years, people would still tell me about it. And sometimes like people who are being thoughtful, like I've had like people explain to me how medication abortion works. And I'm like, I, I'm aware, thank you. Um, and so there's like that of just like this assumption, but then there's also some of just of the ridiculousness. And I wanna be clear that the examples that you gave are not just like random people said these things. The one about um, abortion powering your lights, I was sitting in Congress at a hearing supporting an abortion storyteller as she was sharing her story. And the president of Uni Americans United for Life testified to this, that that is how lights are being powered in my home of Washington, DC. And then was like, it's true, look it up. But the thing is, is that we can sit here and be like, this is as ridiculous as we want, like, but the reality is that this is what's being written into laws. This is what they're mandating that we learn. And I think to your point, like why not just say lies and just why would we call it abortion explaining? Well, we start out in the chapter with some of the ridiculous ones that you named. And I think those are the easy ones to say, oh, this is ridiculous. Of course, it doesn't cause tornadoes, right? But we actually wanted to get to the, the deeper story of, well, why do they say this to begin with? Why compare abortion to tornadoes and say that, you know, because our country accepts abortion, therefore that's why we have hurricanes or tornadoes. Well, one, it's to blame people who have abortions and to just hate on abortion. But also it's to avoid having a conversation about the systemic issues such as economic justice and um, environmental justice, climate change. Why can some people move from an area and others can't? Why can some people afford to have 30 year houses and others can't, right? What does that all mean? The environmental racism of it all. But then we also then later in that chapter get into the ones that you've probably heard that are a lot more pervasive, like abortion is black genocide. Abortion is slavery. Abortion is the Holocaust. And I'm sure you have loved ones or maybe even yourself at one point believed those things or are like, oh, maybe it could be true, right? We wanted to be able to show that Sometimes there's these fringe ideas that are based on racism and economic injustice, classism, all of those things. They then can become a mainstream idea, like some of the deeper ones and how insidious they are. I just want to add, because, you know, a lot of what happens, well, one, it, it invites people to have a judgment, put a judgment on abortion instead of questioning the fact that they're telling someone what to do about their own body. And so it was also really important for us to put this in the perspective of like, no, they want you to think that abortion is gross so that you don't have an abortion, but ultimately you should be able to decide what is right for your own body. So you can't let like the the noise of, because all of this is abortion stigma. And, we, and the, our book is really grounded in 
the fact that we all have a lot of work to do on an individual level, but also on a systemic level to address abortion stigma. And these abortion explaining, this abortion explaining is what contributes to abortion stigma. And it's the things that, and as Renee said, like it's, it's an escalation of, st of stigma, right? Um, and becomes more pervasive as we get through the chapter. Um, but it's also just about us rethinking how we address one another when it comes to our own decisions about our own bodies. And that includes the, you know, the abortion is black genocide and things like that. Now, both of these books deal with liberation and freedom. So just so that we are all on the same page, I would like to ask you to explain what you mean by liberation and what you mean by freedom. What is the difference? What do they mean? What's the difference? And um, each of you can give your own explanation because I'm guessing there will be some difference. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate this conversation. Really excited to be here. And I want to start by saying I, I believe in an unequivocal free Palestine. Um, and I hope that folks in the room believe it as well. Um, so when I think about, so I, I come at this as an educator, right? Um, I've been teaching at Syracuse now for a few years, but I've been an educator for a very long time. I started adjuncting back in 2011. And that was when I first realized that there were ways that I had learned about my own history, um, ways I had learned about my elders and my foremothers and forefolks that was not in alignment with the actual empirical world around me, right? Um, I start off my book talking about, you know, walking into a Borders bookstore and picking up Melissa Harris Perry's sister citizen and learning about like the mammy stereotype and these tropes about black women that I had never heard of in an academic sense, but had seen uh, projected onto black women in my own community. So for me, I tell my young people, and I talk about this in the first chapter, that freedom um, is, is layered, right? Freedom is not a, a one-stop shop. We always talk about getting to freedom somewhere we're gonna get there one day. But I tell them that freedom is complex, it's complicated. There's freedom from the oppressive structures that we're used to interacting with. There's freedom from um, the systems that we all live under, but there's also freedom to become the versions of ourselves that we know um, will, will teach us how to be the best uh, individuals and citizens that we intend to be. And liberation, um, we often see freedom and liberation as synonymous, but the truth is, is that the only reason why we have liberation is because we have unfreedom, right? The only reason why we need to be liberated from a thing is because we've been oppressed. And so what I try to teach my students is that if we stop framing our ideas of what freedom can be based on the oppressions we experience, we have a much uh, broader vantage point and idea of the possibilities of what we can obtain on the other side, right? It's about our political imagination. And that's what the book is really, I think, trying to get us toward, like thinking more expansively about who we are, who we can become through the lens of who our ancestors have already taught us how to be. So based on what Jen just said, uh, Regina, I'm sorry, Renee, these R's. I know, I know, it's fine. Renee, so it sounds like, and tell me if this is what you think, liberation is the verb to reach freedom. Liberation is the action taken to reach the state. Freedom is a state. Is that, what do you think about that? You know, I, well, someone asked me, they were like, what does abortion liberation mean to you? And I was like, well, I mean, I could write all off a bunch of policies, right? But also like, to me, abortion liberation is like a vibe. And it's like, when someone is experiencing any sort of reproductive decision or a pregnancy, right, do they actually feel like they have everything they need to be able to make whatever decision is best for them? And I don't just mean like the literal like money in the bank account or ability to get to a clinic or whatever it is, but I also mean the support. Do they feel like they have enough information? Do they feel loved? Do they feel cared for? Because one of the things that is, is so common is that for both of us, we felt so isolated during our abortion experiences. But also, we have talked to so many people who felt like they actually wanted to be able to parent, but they didn't feel like they had the support or didn't feel like they had the money. So like, what does it look like for all of us to be able to 
feel that support and unconditional love and and show up for one another. And to me, I think that is sort of the like liberation vibes. But then on a policy level, like what does it actually mean for people to be able to have the ability to decide if, when, and how to grow their families free from state-sanctioned violence and coercion? And so we actually cannot get to liberation without the abolition of police. We cannot get that get to that without making sure that that people have community and support because there is no way that people can make free decisions about their pregnancies and their futures while under the fear of being policed or living under bombs that our tax dollars are paying for, as is happening in Palestine. Um, that is happening in our own communities. I mean, hello, it happened in, in Philadelphia. Like, it, you know, it's constantly happening. And so we have to be real about that these pregnancy decisions are being made. I know I was thinking about what does it mean to have a Black child as Black children are being shot in the streets. All of that factors in. What does it look like for us to create a world in which you can make those decisions? And that actually doesn't have to factor in. That's a level of freedom that like, it feels like an imagination at this point because everything is so chaotic. And yet that is the world that we are trying to paint a picture for and a pathway for and strive towards. Sure. I, um, I, I wanna read something before you jump in. Um, just in addition to what you said, in the book um, you say, you're talking about a, a, a pamphlet um, that spoke about reproductive freedom. And it says, reproductive freedom, um, it, this pamphlet gave it an expansive definition that includes the right to be provided with comprehensive, age-appropriate information about sexuality and reproductive health, to choose to have and not have a child, to have good, affordable health care for safe pregnancies and deliveries, to easily access contraception, contraceptive, abortion, and infertility health care, and to make one's own informed, safe, and effective reproductive health choices. Go. I feel like I had a different answer, but right now in this moment, I'm thinking differently about things because I've been reading your book, Jen, and how you talk about Harriet Jacobs mm -hmm. and freedom and the, the freedom that can come from stillness and quiet. That's right. And so my liberation in this moment is slightly different from the liberation in this book because mm -hmm. of Amber Thurman, because mm -hmm. of Candy Miller, and because of the ways in which as much as we can, and it's hard to talk about this because it is very new. As much as we can in our own lives break abortion stigma, all of these things, there is still the violence in our communities of what the state is doing, right. of what these, ho you know, you think if you are sick, you go to a hospital and they will treat you. No. And Amber Thurman was forced to wait 20 hours before the hospital she went to in Georgia finally gave her a DC, but by then it was too late and she died from, from sepsis from a, from an abortion because there was fetal tissue left in her uterus that could have been easily taken out had that DNC been done earlier. And so it is, it is so critical that we, on an individual level, work toward liberation, but I do think it looks different. It, ha it has to look, you know, it, it has to move to a systemic level. And we are in our book talking about the freedom that comes from seeing healthcare outside of a healthcare system because we've been lied to about this healthcare system. And I think, um, Amber, you know, Amber Thurman, C Kenny Miller, both examples of the ways in which we have been forced to believe that if we medicalize in institutions, put healthcare in institutions, we'll get what we need and we'll always survive. But those institutions are being run by the state that's creating laws that prevents us from getting the healthcare that we need. And so I don't know where that fits into that, but it's connected. I think I want to add too, I appreciate you for bringing in Harry, Harry Jacobs, right? I think that I wouldn't say that freedom is a state, 
right? And I don't, I don't say that in the book. I say in the book that, the, that freedom, I agree with Angela Davis, that it's a constant struggle, mm -hmm. right? Freedom is a process. We are constantly struggling toward freedom. And sometimes we may never reach it, right? I was talking to someone earlier today about, you know, even this current moment and people feeling powerless around Palestine, people feeling powerless around uh, state-sanctioned violence against black and brown people, uh, people feeling powerless about the attacks on queer and trans folks. And the fact that we have to understand that there may be little freedoms on the way, right? There may be little wins. And I say this as an organizer, as someone who has had wins, big wins and big losses, right? Um, hearing you discuss, discuss these issues is reminding me of Fannie Lou Hamer, right? Who got a Mississippi appendectomy, who went into the hospital to have a, a routine uh, surgery and they took away her right to have children, right? Um, this is not new. These, these are systems that have actively been working to criminalize and uh, deviantize black bodies, especially black women's bodies for generations, right? And so if we were to set freedom as an endpoint we would be demoralized. We would be depressed trying to set freedom as a state of getting to. And so what I hope to do in this book is for us to understand that we are constantly working. These are projects of struggle toward freedom. These are projects of struggle in liberation solidarity. And we do so by remembering these true stories. We do so by telling the truth of our empirical experiences in the material world, right? By having these important conversations and by not being silenced by the systems that want us to disappear and be eradicated. I'm glad you mentioned Harriet. I was gonna bring her up since you guys took care of that. I'm gonna jump. You said, um, Jen, you just said something that this is not new. The, the oppression is not new, but you know what's also not new? women taking charge of their lives, um, abortion, reproductive health, it's not new. In Liberating Abortion, you write, medical, religious, and historical texts, including Jewish Talm the Jewish Talmud, Egyptian papyrus documents, and Chinese and Arabic medical writings, illustrate the use of abortive fashions and the prevalence of abortion in ancient times. This is not new. We have been taking care of our bodies and making choices since we've been here, since humanity has begun. Now, some will want you to think that it is new, but it's not. Um, and so I had not thought about it in that far reaching. And I don't think most people have. And I would like for you to talk more about um, an abbreviated history of um, women terminating pregnancies, making family decisions, and the use of teas and other um, other abortive fashions, other ways that prior to the medical procedure. Yeah, this was a history chapter that was supposed to be one chapter and became three um, because it was just so vast and expansive, and you know everything from um, there's different herbs like Queen Anne's Lace and Penny Royal. We actually have both of them. They're on the cover of the book, um, along with Birthwort, um, to like crocodile feces and like other things, which I'm glad we don't really use anymore. <laughs> um, but like Dioscorides, who was like a um, an ancient like medical writer, like wrote down um, abortion wine, which would be kind of cool if we brought that back. I don't know. Let's let's get our medicine in whatever way works for us. Just right? drink it and, and call it whatever you want. <laughs> well, and it was funny because it, it, the the recipes were so funny because they'd be like, you know, ha some a woman who has fasted, give them this much of this herb and this tea, and then take them under the armpits and shake them for a certain amount of time. Like they were they were like kind of silly, but the reality is obviously some of them worked because they wrote it down, and I think. That is what's fascinating in the ways that they knew that people would need to be able to end a pregnancy for whatever reason. And so they needed to write that down. I think two quick stories that I'll tell um, are around abortion pills. So there's a lot of conversation about abortion pills today. And states like Louisiana are trying to um, ban possession of them, all the all the things. Right. But 
when we talk about abortion pills, we, we tell the story wrong in two different ways. One, we say, well, you know, mifepristone, the abortion pill, it was created in 1988 and came to the United States in 2000. Technically, that's actually not true. Um, back in the 1800s, they used to take tansy um, and they ground it up and put it into a pill or a powder. And that is what was well advertised in newspapers and ads all across the country. Now, it's really difficult for us to even be able to put up a little ad about a medication abortion on social media because the companies take it down or a bus ad or in a newspaper, right? It's controversial. So the things today that are considered controversial were actually really commonplace. So abortion pills, not a new thing. In, real, in reality, they're like 200 something years old. The other piece is the idea of um, the invention of the abortion pill and that it was invented in France in 1988. Well, no. In Brazil, there were women who needed abortions and pharmacists who were working with them and they would give them medications that they said, don't take these while you're pregnant. And so if you didn't want to be pregnant, you could take them. And so it was a series of trial and error and collaboration between the patients and the pharmacist, pharmacists putting some meds to the side and saying, try this, try that. Let's see if it works. Um, and eventually they put one that um, is called Cytotec or Misoprostol, which we still use today. They kept putting that to the side because the folks who would use it to end the pregnancy said, this one works really well. And so they'd keep putting it to the side. And so I think we forget that ingenuity can be in our communities, that we actually have all of the answers and resources that we need and that we can show up. I think we, we're so socialized to think about that like medicine comes from the top down and they tell us, no, we actually have this in our bodies. We can show up. We have the knowledge in our communities. That is also why they're trying to keep us from talking about it. That is why they're banning books. That is why they're banning sharing the self-managed abortion protocol with pills, right? They're trying to keep us from knowing the information. So these are things that our ancestors have passed down for thousands of years. And it's imperative for all of us to keep that tradition alive. Could I just add how it became criminalized? Because I do think it's an important part of it that was systemat systemic, right? So um, up until the 1800s, abortion was not criminalized. In our country, people, it was an open secret. Everyone was having abortions. Um, but then around the late 1800s, the American Medical Association launched this crusade against midwives who were at that time mostly black women, immigrant women, who were providing abortions because they were concerned that what that people of color were going to outnumber the white people in this country. And um, this is actual history. Like we're not making this up. This is we didn't. They we didn't literally make this said up. aliens, and it, they literally said it very clearly. Right. So the American the American Medical Association Association launched this crusade against midwives to push them out. Right. So they labeled them quacks. They said their practice was barbaric. And that's why for so long we all had this stigma against midwives. It's because it was ingrained in us through this culture around midwives. But in actuality, they were the experts. They were the ones who had the best birth rates and the least amount of mortality rates, right? Because as soon as these doctors who sought to professionalize the medical in industry and specifically to professionalize the OBGYN industry, which was built on the backs of enslaved mo women, which would be another conversation, but still true and important to understand, they, they pushed midwives out of the industry and then made what they were doing illegal through these state laws that began popping up. And so that's why for so long abortion has been stigmatized in this country. It's because of racism. It's because of the racism in the medical industry that established the OBGYN field and prof professionalized the field, but really pushed out. And then I just wanted to mention that once they, they did push out most of the midwives, what did we see? We saw the rates of um, maternal mortality increased. We saw the rates of infant mortality increase because these were people who didn't actually have the experience of helping women and people give birth without dying. And so that's what happened. Jen, um, abortion sounds like a form of self-care. And you speak about self-care. Um, you talk about Audre Lorde. And I wanted to ask you to read 
something. Now, this isn't from the Audrey Lord section, but I, I do want to um, ask you to read this and then, um, yes, it, or I can read it, but I'd rather you read it. Um, and then to speak to us about um, self care in terms of women and in terms of activists and leaders, um, as you do in the book. Um, for black women to be our own comrades, we must allow ourselves to face our innermost hurts and vulnerabilities before they turn into malignant tumors and undetected strokes. We must allow ourselves space and time for rest, quiet and peace. We must not see our stillness as laziness, as the world believes, but as time to restore the energy that has already been spent we must allow ourselves to see community not as only extractive, but as a site of implantation, newness, and rejuvenation. And we must fiercely defend our rights to own ourselves and our bodies. Thank you. Now, you write, you spend time writing about um, Audre Lorde and how when she became sick that she did focus on caring for herself. But a lot of times it takes that crisis for us to stop down and do that. Um, and I'd like you to just expound on this notion of, of self-care. Yeah. I mean, I think I also want to draw a little thread um, between what we just talked about and the medicalization of Black women's trauma. Um, I talk in the book about J. Marion Sims and the ways that he built his entire um, kind of legacy off of the idea that Black women don't feel pain in the same ways that other folks do. Um, he conducted awful surgeries um, and violences on black, enslaved black women who, um, if you all know, had no right to consent to anything. Um, and so if they were um, lent to uh, Dr. Sims um, by their slave owners, they could not say, no, I do not consent into this surgery. There was no anesthesia. These surgeries happened on them when they were wide awake. Um, and so, um, I draw that thread through the book to talk about the ways that our bodies have been um, kind of co-opted and consumed as public goods, right? So much of what we do as Black women, we're asked to do in public. We're asked to heal in public. We're asked to hurt in public. We're asked to bear our souls in public. And what happens, and witnessing this from organizers and also from the lives of our elders, um, most of the women in this book um, and on this cover um, died in their 50s and 60s, right? They died of strokes. Um, Zora Neale Hurston died of malnutrition. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer died of many complications and was, told, and was written on her death certificate that she was a housekeeper, right? Um, so even in our deaths, we are often, um, our, our, our realities are rewritten. And so in that chapter and in the Audre Lorde section, I'm really trying to sit with what Lord offered us, which was a meditation on her own reflections, right? In her cancer journal, she talks about all the time she spent giving away her energy, giving away her life sources, only to at the end of her life not have much left, right? At the end of her life, she felt that she uh, had finally understood what stillness meant and what it meant to really hold um, that love and care just for herself. And if you read the cancer journals, they're very sad, right? Because she's speaking about times where she could not speak, where she would go in weeks uh, in pain, um, and that those were still some of the most fulfilling times in her life because she had started leaning into joy and reconciliation with herself and with her body. And so what I ask in the book is, why do we have to wait? Why do we have to wait until we're ailing, until we're broken, until we can't walk, until we can't speak, until we can't see, to say, maybe I should pour something back into myself? Why do we have, why do our Black feminist teachers and foremothers have to give us so much? Why do we take so much from them that we send them into an early grade? So really, I'm, I'm asking of us, Right, I'm asking of us to show up differently for our feminist foremothers and for folks, but also asking us, those of us who are black women, to show up for ourselves. 
right? Right. You you write that your friend said you love you love black people so much that includes what about you? you. That's my best friend. Yeah, she 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 checked me in graduate school. She said, "Hey, I need you to sit down uh, because you're doing too much." You know, I was like, I love I was I was in the midst of the movement for Black Lives. I was doing all this organizing. I have three children. I was feeling very stressed. I was feeling very burnt out. And I was trying to figure out how to be everything for everyone. And she said, hey, you, you keep talking about how you love Black people, but what does that mean for you, Jen? What does it mean for you to love yourself in this moment? And I had to really reckon with what that meant because I have not been socialized to love myself, right? Mm -hmm. Young Black girls, we're not socialized to love ourselves, we are socialized to give the love to everyone else, especially in a heteronormative dynamic. Give the love to a future husband who doesn't exist yet, right? We have to present ourselves in certain ways, button up the dress, wear these stockings, all these things that hurt and don't feel good, right? For somebody we may never even meet, right? So we are raised to build a version of ourselves to perform for a society that does not pour that love back into us. And really, this book is hopefully a reclamation to say, you don't have to do that. Not only do you not have to do it, you shouldn't do it. When it they're giving, I think we've got about five minutes left. So um, there's so much more. I got all these cards. I don't have time. <laughs> um, so I want to move to the end. Both of these books are filled with history, um, personal stories, intimate revelations, um, the kind of memoir, history, but um, I also think self-help, and in that self-help phase, I see it more um, as action. This is not, these aren't action adventure books, um, but I think you will go on an adventure when you- <laughs> Abortion, the ride. Right, right. Um, but action, that is what, you know, after we, we learn our history, we, um, Praise the women who've influenced us and who've um, done the work for us. But then what are we going to do? Black women taught us, what are we teaching? Uh, so I want to leave with the question of what are we teaching and what I know a lot of people want a prescription from you to say, what do I need to do? What am I supposed to do? So uh, I'll ask you guys to answer those questions. Yeah, I just want to jump in because it's, Answers both. No, what you were talking about, abortion, what we are arguing in this book is that abortion is self-love. And that we are told that it is everything but. But we argue, actually, it's anti-capitalist. Because it is pouring back into yourself, deciding confidently that you are, you have, the majority of people who have abortions are people who already have children. You are good where you are. If you go any further, you're going to be overextended. You probably already are overextended. But you're, you know, abortion is self-love. And so that is the message. That is the action. that, it, And that is the gospel to share with everyone. Love yourself. I'm sorry? Love yourself. Yes. Love yourself. And whether that's have an abortion or have an abortion and then start getting ready for having a child if that's what you really want, which was my experience. And I explain it in the book. I'm actually, we talked about this earlier. I'm actually going to borrow from Stacey Abrams. Uh, oh, I'm oh not, no. damn. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> then I got to come up with something. But like, I, I get asked a lot of like, okay, so what's the takeaway from the book? What can, what should people do? And I think, you know, with all of the attacks on abortion and pregnancy decision making and trans bodies and queer families, and all of those things all at once, it can feel really overwhelming. And yes, of course, we have to make systemic change and we have to do those things. But this morning, as Stacey Abrams was talking to the children, she said that, you know, you can do something somewhere soon. And I would add for someone, because think about the people in your life. Every single one of you loves someone who's had an abortion. It is so true. And if you think you don't, it is because that person doesn't feel like they can share with you. At some point, someone is going to come up to you and say, I'm pregnant. And the question is, how are you going to show up for them? Are you going to put your judgment of, ooh, girl, it ain't the right time, with him? <laughs> we all know that feeling. 
I deal with it too. I'm not perfect. But how do we resist that and actually say, how can, what, do you, what support do you need? How can I be there for you? How can I hold your hand? Sometimes it's just listening in silence. That's, you talked about the silence and the peace. Sometimes it's just being there for somebody, right? And that is how you can do something for someone somewhere soon, right? Think about how we are showing up for the people in our lives, the people that we love who need abortions or have pregnancy experiences, whatever they decide. Yeah, I think if I could just, you know, give us a synopsis, I would say so many of us love black women, right? We have black women who have loved us, that that church lady with the candy mm -hmm. in the bottom of her bag. And it's always good candy. Um, it's like Brock's, you know? <laughs> Um, and, and when we think back on our childhoods and the ways that somebody laughed, you know that Brock's, you remember that Brock's, um, I, I wrote this book for those women, right? I wrote this book for, I opened the book talking about my auntie Donna Faye and my auntie Barbara, right? These women who have no blood ties to me, but who are kin and who I'll never forget. And so I, I want us to be thinking about the way so many black women have worked for us and on our behalves and they didn't ask for anything. And they don't ask for anything but for us to be the best versions of ourselves, but for us to pour into our communities. And that doesn't mean we don't have to give them anything. We still should. They deserve our care. They deserve our love. And not after they've passed away, not after they're gone, while they are still here. That's what I'm hoping this book will encourage. Thank you. And I'd like to close with, Another reading from Liberating Abortion. I feel like I'm, I'm a preacher. Another reading. <laughs> from the Gospel of Abortion. Yes. There have always been those who have stood in the way of our exercising our rights, who tried to restrict our choices. There probably always will be. But we who have been oppressed should not be swayed in our opposition to tyranny of any kind especially attempts to take away our reproductive freedom. You may believe abortion is wrong. You may decide that abortion is not an option you would choose. Reproductive freedom guarantees your right not to. All that we ask is that no one deny another human being the right to make her own decision.